Good morning again. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys as always. Sorry, I'm thirsty already. That's, I don't know if that's a good sign or not, but it's it's going to happen. No, it's good good to worship with you guys. Um, I'll add a little side note. Last week, I know I was a little tearier than, than normal. Um, you know, it was, it was a tough topic anyway. But then, you know, knowing some of your stories and seeing you guys, it didn't help. So once it started, you know, it kept flowing. This week, since we're talking about tithing, I probably won't cry quite as much. <laughs> um, but it's still, it's still a heavy topic. It's just not on that far um, edge of the scale as, as last week's was. Last week was one of the harder of the questions that, we're going to be going through or have dealt with, you know, but today, and you say, just like a preacher, we're going to talk about money, you know, that's, but you guys know, I'm not the preacher that I don't like talking about it, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it, you know, the truth is many Christians struggle with the topic of, of giving, you know, pro- part of it is some churches you know, focus on giving to a point where they overemphasize it and use it as as guilt, use that guilt as a weapon. I've been to churches where you have to come up and give the offering, and if the preacher didn't see you come up, they're going to call you out. I'm not going to do that to you, okay? That's, we've got anonymous donation boxes. You can do it online. We, you know, we're not, we're not doing that. Um, whereas some, maybe I'm closer to this end of the spectrum, are afraid to even bring it up. Well, obviously, I'm not that afraid because I'm bringing it up today. I just don't bring it up every Sunday. But the truth is, people in ministry, pastors, they get the bad rep, you know, where they either rarely talk about money or they rarely talk about anything else but money. You know, the former, they're afraid of sounding greedy and manipulative. You know, don't want that that understanding that, well, we're going to use guilt to make you give. You know, and I understand that you have to be careful with that. But then the latter consider wealth a spiritual birthright for believers. You know, the, the more blessed you are financially, obvious it, the obvious sign to them is, well, you're closer to God, right? So there's obvious a, obviously a middle to this topic. Because some people, money is an enemy, whereas some, they see it as an entitlement. But it's not either one of those. And therefore, because we've got both ends of that spectrum, because there is that stereotype out there when it comes to, you know, my kind as preachers or churches in general, you know, because there's a lack of emphasis or the overemphasis of money, there. The truth is many Christians don't understand that giving is intended to be a joy and a blessing. Instead, we, you know, I've used them too. We all use a myriad of self-justifications to make us feel okay about not giving to the church, not giving to the ministry. But again, giving is meant to bring joy. Giving is an act of worship. That's why Stephen says it almost every Sunday. I've said it a, a several dozen times that we are continuing worship in a time of giving because that's what it should be. That's what it is. But I grew up in a good old Southern Baptist church, and you know, I was, was taught that there's not a difference between tithes and offerings. But those words are not synonymous, okay? So we've got to push that aside right right away I, I grew up thinking they were synonymous now they're related but not synonymous and I you know, was taught I believe that an essential element of my Christian life was giving 10 percent you know it wasn't regarded as necessary for salvation but we didn't question the basics of tithing that is tithing or a tenth that's why it's not the same as an offering, okay? Tithe means strict 10% of your income, of the gifts that you give to the church. If it's 10%, then yes, you do give a tithe. You know, growing up, 
it wasn't debated whether we as believers are biblically obligated to give a strict 10%. It was simply assumed that I never questioned the practice. I never asked until, you know, a few years ago, are we as Christians obligated to tithe? Again, go ahead and push aside the mindset that, oh, well, of course we're supposed to give. That's not the question. The question is, are we, according to Scripture, obligated, commanded to give a tithe, 10%? You know, so we understand we're supposed to be generous with our finances. We're supposed to give back a portion of our money, of our work, to support the ministry. You know, we, we can see that all throughout the New Testament, the early church, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, chapters 8 and 9, both, you know, make it very clear that generosity, giving to the ministry, is a part of a Christian's life. And so the question is not whether we give, but it is asking, are we biblically and morally obligated, according to the Old Testament laws, to tithe to give 10 percent we can look at the scripture to back it up leviticus 27 30 says in all the tithe of the land whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the lord's it is holy unto the lord and we see that also repeated in numbers 18 26 deuteronomy 14 24 and second chronicles 31 5 that a tithe for Israel was a requirement of the law. The Israelites were to give 10% of their crops and their livestock to the temple. You know, so most believe it was actually more like a 20% gift because they would give 10% of their grain, 10% of their livestock. So we're talking more than just 10%, it's a tenth of everything. And then there were multiple other areas in which they would give to the temple give back to the lord so we know that's in scripture we know that was a law for israel but where we get into trouble as believers sometimes is that christians roll over this command for israel and say that that is also for us that is you and i in under the new covenant of christ this law still stands but what happens is Pastors, Christians in general had the tendency, we, we pick and choose which of the mosaic laws, the sacrificial, ceremonial, whatever it may be, we take out certain decrees of the old covenant and say that still governs us under the new covenant of Christ. And you've all heard it. You know, they can, they'll look back and say, well, you know, tattoos, you can't have that. So they'll pull that one and say, you still have to follow that. How about eating pork? There's some that say, well, that's in the Old Testament um, law. You can't eat pork. Or they even demand, in some cases, the old covenant, old law penalties for when the, you know, certain laws are broken. But what we have to be careful of is we pick and choose which ones we like and say, these still apply. But what about the ones you're skipping over? You, you can't have it both ways. You can't mix and say, these still apply to New Covenant Christians. These do not. You know, they, you're more traditional. You say, of course, tattoos are still taboo. It's, it's in the Old Testament. But we can mix fabric threads. That's okay, even though that also is in the Old Covenant. They say, in some cases, eating pork is unclean. But mixing dairy with meat is not, even though that too is in the Old Covenant. Some churches have taken the Old Testament command of tithing also and now forced that command on Christians today because they say, well, if we tell them it's commanded, if we force it, then maybe we'll get our 10% at the church. And so, again, we have to be careful by saying, I like this law, we're going to keep it. I don't like this law, we're not going to keep it. So again, the question is, does the Bible command believers under the new covenant, you and I, believers in Christ, to give a strict tithe according to the Old Testament Mosaic law? You know, we have to understand 
in Christ, the new covenant is grace. Jesus tells us himself, as we talked about last year going through the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus came to fulfill the law. What does that mean? It means the ceremonial, the cleansing, the sacrificial aspects of the law are fulfilled in him. Of course, the moral and ethical aspects are still relevant. Laws of morality and ethics defined by God what is good, what is evil. But when Christ died on the cross, he fulfilled the requirements of the law, and whether you want to believe it or not, made the mandatory tithe obsolete. And I know you're like, whoa, preacher, you ain't supposed to say that. Then we can't give. No, I'm not saying that. You got to stick with me a little bit longer, okay? But we get where people continue to insist that this is still in effect because we like that law, but... There's some we say, well, obviously that doesn't, that doesn't count. No, if Christ fulfilled the law, the, these cleansing aspects, he fulfilled these, not the moral and ethical, but the ceremonial aspects of the law, and we say, yet yeah, this is still in effect, we're at least saying it nullifies the sacrifice of Christ when we return this idea of justification by works and law-keeping. The new covenant is grace, and if it is grace, then we understand we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But then there's, again, the, that sect in Christianity that says, yeah, by grace and faith, but don't forget, you have to give a strict 10%. Don't forget, you also have to do this. You also have to do that. Work, yes, grace without works is dead, but the more we try to pile on works for the sake of salvation, we're missing the point of grace completely. So for us, for you and I, no, we are not commanded to give a strict 10%. I still do just because it's a good figure. And that works for myself and Allison and my family. But for us as believers today, that is not a mandatory commandment for you and I. Instead, today, it is God's love that compels a Christian to give, not obligation. And that's why, really, Christian tithing, even though it's made synonymous with offerings, tithing today is a misnomer because Christians are under no obligation to fulfill that strict command of a strict 10% that was given to Israel so many years ago. And whether you want, you know, like to hear or not, you may actually like to hear this. The New Testament nowhere commands that Christians submit to a legalistic tithe system. Paul states that believers should set aside a portion of their income as an offering. But again, that's a different word than tithe. It is not a tithe. We see that in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Set aside a portion, something that you feel in confidence that this is what God would want you to give back to the ministry because what Paul repeats over and over is that Christian giving is a result of Christian love the love of Christ is what spurs us to give back it helps us understand that what I have isn't mine to begin with that I am simply a steward and in order to be a good steward I then bless others in the proportionate way that I have been blessed so again the New Testament nowhere commands doesn't even recommend that a Christian submit to the legalistic tithing system it doesn't designate another percentage of income that you should give it doesn't give a minimum but rather first Corinthians 16 2 says in keeping with income again it's proportionate but Again, it's okay if you do 10. Some have taken the 10% figure and said, it worked good then, it works for me. And they apply as a recommended minimum, if you will, for believers. But it becomes an issue when we take this recommendation and now make it forced requirement if you're going to be a good Christian. Well, you don't give as much as 10%, so... Obviously, you're, you're not to that level spiritually. You're, you're not, you know, who you are called to be. 
But again, it becomes an issue when we take a recommendation and say, this is now a requirement when the New Testament never says that. Because true giving is worship. And worshipful giving has to be voluntary, not forced. As any form of worship is, it is something that comes out of us naturally, something that flows with an understanding of God, understanding of grace. And so when I give voluntarily, I'm not forced. It means I'm doing it for a reason, and that reason is to bless others and to glorify God. And so the principle that we see in the New Testament is to give voluntarily support the needs of others, to support Christian workers, to support the ministers, the pastors, and to expand Christian outreach. Again, there's no specific amount or percentage ever commanded nor even suggested. The early church, they didn't focus on a specific amount, but rather this is a need that needs to be met, so let's do what is needed to meet that need. Sometimes it was much more than a tithe, so much more than a tenth, because some of them sold their homes, they sold their land in order to meet the needs of the church, and that was out of Christian love. It was out of understanding of who God is, what God has done, and now what can I do in return? We see it in Acts um, 2 and even in Acts 4. Acts 2, 45 says, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. This was a church who focused on building one another up, encouraging one another, and taking care of one another's needs. We see example in Romans as, as Paul writes, says Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. He also goes in later on in, in a few occasions talking about the need to support those who work in the ministry. 1 Timothy 5.18, it says, for, for Scripture says, he's quoting Old Testament, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. The laborer deserves his wages. He's talking about those who are ministering to the people, those who were serving directly in the church. Paul is saying, you need to take care of those people. And this is repeated throughout the New Testament, this desire to give, the need to give. And when we understand what grace has done for us and what God has done for us, either little to scale others or great, we give proportionally out of love. And so while there's no tithe that is demanded of the Christian, the New Testament shows us the importance and the benefits of giving. So again, don't misconstrue this and say, well, shoot, I don't ever have to give. No, if we are believers, that is a part of who we are, is a part of our faith. And that's why Paul spends so much time showing the importance and the benefits of giving. And he was doing it for the benefit of those serving in the church. He's, he wasn't saying, you got to pay me this minimum for me to show up in your city. But now that I'm leaving, you need to support those who are following in my steps. Support those who are leading you, who are sharing the gospel, who is serving in this local church. Support them and support the widows, support the orphans. That's what we're called to do. So we are to give, as Paul says, as we are able. Sometimes that means more than 10%, more than a strict tithe. 10% is great. 10% works, works wonderful for some people. Some people can do more. Some say, right now, I just can't for whatever reason. But it all depends on the ability of the Christian and the needs of the body of Christ. So every Christian should diligently pray and seek God's wisdom in the matter. As James 1 tells us, when we lack wisdom, come to God seeking that wisdom, seeking that clarity. God, if it's not 10%, then what is it? Is it more? Is it right now a time in my life where I can only do eight, I can only do five for righteous reasons, not selfish reasons? Asking God wisdom and clarity so that when we give, it is done so in a worshipful mindset. Because 
if it's an offering, again, a forced tithe, there's not a whole lot of worship in that. But a true offering, a offering out of love, out of worship, it is given with pure motives. It's given with an attitude of worship, as an attitude of service to the body. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 12, it's giving that glorifies God, and it's not a percentage, but it's proportionate to one's income, to one's assets, to what one has. We give in proportionate amount to that. Again, not percentages, but in proportionate. And so that's why Paul continues, and he spends a great deal of time in 2 Corinthians. We're not get through it all, but I did want to share one of the, you know, deeper aspects or passages as Paul is writing to this Corinthian church on what sacrificial love and worship comes about with a true heart of of giving and offering. So we're going to pick up in verse 6 of chapter 9, 2 Corinthians. It says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has de decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all other. What Paul is telling us is getting to the root cause, getting to the, the truth of what Christian giving in a loving, worshipful way looks like and how it benefits us. Because giving that glorifies God is done with the understanding that we receive as you know, individuals who receive blessing, receive income, receive anything that we get with the understanding that it's all because of God anyway. Yes, I work hard and so do you, but just the ability to breathe, to get up and go to work is a blessing from God that we often take for granted. So we, Paul is saying we receive blessings. We receive everything we have so that we can give not so that we can hoard to ourselves. It's this principle of sowing and reaping that many have thrown way out in the left field. But what Paul is saying is the principle of sowing and reaping is that if you give generously now, you will discover that God not only sustains your desire to give, but also greatly increase your resources for more joyful giving in the future. Many have taken that and said, well, that means if I give, I'm going to get back tenfold in wealth and money. It's not always money. It's not this, if I give to God, I'm going to be rich tomorrow. That's not how that works. But rather, God is saying he's going to sustain that desire, that heart of service, that heart of love for those around you and make it possible for you to be sustained, to not hoard, but to continue to give. Because God promises to supply abundantly to those who give generously. That's the picture that Paul is painting. He wanted the Corinthians to be free from the fear that, well, if I'm generous in my giving, then I'll be the one needing a love offering. Paul's saying that's not how this works. The Lord will sustain you through a worshipful heart, a worshipful understanding of what this giving truly is. You know, this is not the name it and claim it of the prosperity gospel. Again, it's not this, I'll give a little bit and receive a hundred times. 
I'll go ahead and tell you, if a, pro if a preacher promised you wealth when you send them $1,000 right now, then either walk out of that church or turn off that TV because that is not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying the Lord will sustain you because of your generosity. The Lord will continue to supply abundantly so that you can now continue to provide for others around you. It's not this mindset that, well, if I give now, I can't pay this off. If I can't pay this off, they'll be putting in a love offering from me. You know, that's not what Paul is saying. He's reminding them that that's not a fear you should have. Because reaping and sowing is a promise with a purpose. The purpose of this reaping and sowing through generosity is to glorify God, to build the church, and to expand the gospel of Jesus Christ. We give so that, as verse 8 says, you may abound in every good work. We give, and in, in receipt, we're able to continue to grow in good works that serve others. As verse 10 says, we give in order to increase the harvest of your righteousness. We will grow in righteousness, grow in our understanding of God and our walk with God. And we give and sow you know, abundantly, as verse 11 says, in order to produce thanksgiving to God. Others will be drawn to God through that generosity. That's some of the reaping we get back is we grow in the knowledge of God. Others grow in the knowledge of God. We're able to grow in our good works for God and for the gospel. And so we sow generously in order to grow in Christ. We sow generously to thrive in good works. We sow generously to develop a thankful and worshipful heart to God and to lead others in the same. And that's why we give cheerfully. That's why we give that in a way that truly worships and glorifies God. Because true Christian giving should never be a burden. It should never be a source of guilt. And believers, you probably know what guilt I'm talking about. The guilt that leads to a self-justification. It leads to a myriad of excuses why, yes, we could give more, but this is why we don't give what we give. There's a part of you, there's a part of that, that spirit inside you that says, when you do that, is it out of worship to me or is that out of a sense of pride or ego or selfishness? And I'll talk to myself. I'm going to go and tell you it's easy to get into that mindset to be like, well, this is why I'm not doing it right now. This is why I'm not giving. This is, this is why, yes, I know financially I could do more, but the more buts I throw in, the more questions I get to, Am I giving out of worship to God or am I giving because I feel that if I do enough, I'll feel better about myself? Instead, giving is to be a joy, is to be an act of worship. Old Testament, we saw that worship. Even though it was a commandment, those who truly gave and worship to God, we see they gave the best of their crops, the best of their harvest, the best of their livestock. Those who tried to give God leftovers saw the penalty of their actions. You know, the same principle could apply to us in our giving today. God demonstrates everything he's given us. He's shown generosity. And then, unlike many of Israel, we say, but God, I've got all these other things. I have not needs, but wants that now I have to pay for. And therefore... If there's any money left over, I'll give to church. I'll give to you. I'll give you the leftovers. It didn't work good for those in the Old Testament. Why do we think it's going to work good for us? God is worth so much more than our leftovers, but yet many today, and believe me, I've been there. I understand it's easy to say, well, I've got this, and therefore, God, I'll give you what's left over. If there's any left over once I get through this shopping spree or through this this bill that I've been putting off anyway for whatever reason. Whatever that justification is, we pretend as if true worshipful giving means giving God what's left over, if there's any left over at all. And when there's not, we say, well, God, you don't get yours today. 
you know how that sounds, and yet we still do it, don't we? It's easy to focus on self, misunderstand what giving is, and therefore miss out on the joy and the worship that giving should be. That's why Paul is telling us it's not a strict tithe, but rather it's an understanding of what giving is and what giving does both for others and for yourself. And he says a believer should give what he believes God would have him give. And if there's guilt, even lingering guilt on if it's right, then I would question, is it worshipful or is it selfish? It's a question I have to ask when I give. Thankfully, I set up auto pay where I don't even look at it. You know, it just comes out whether I want it to or not. But the reason I do that is because it, it's easy to say, well, just don't write it this month or this week, whatever it may be. And I miss the point of giving. I miss the joy of giving. I miss the worshipful aspect of giving because I'm focused on self and putting God into the leftovers category. But it all, again, comes back to the attitude of the heart. Are we giving out of a reverence for God or out of a selfishness or for our own personal wealth and hoarding to ourselves for whatever reason we use to justify? Or are we giving a proportionate amount to God and the work of the ministry? It is wise to save. There's nothing wrong with saving. But again, it's an understanding of everything we have is because of God. And so faithful, generous stewardship of our financial resources to support the life and ministry of the local church is as much a mark of a true disciple of Christ as is love for, for one another's neighbor. And just as much as sharing the gospel with an unbeliever. We see those as marks of a believer, but we need to see generous giving and proportionate giving as just as much of a mark of a true believer. John writes in 1 John 3, 17 and 18, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? In other words, John was saying generosity, love, and giving is a mark of a disciple of Christ. And if you see that need, have no pity, then I would question is the Spirit of God at work in your life? As believers in Christ, giving in support of the local church truly is no more optional than sexual purity, telling the truth, or sharing our faith. You know, Think about this. Can you honestly imagine a professing, professing Christian, you, know, you see them every week, and they say, yes, I love and follow Jesus. But I've decided what fits for me is that sexual purity and faithfulness to my spouse, that's not for me. That's not what God wants for me. Or say, somebody says, I've decided that as a Christian, lying and stealing is the best way to get around and get along in this world. And then I'll give a tithe out of what I take or what I lie for. The same is true. It's no less of a contradiction of our Christian faith to say, I'm not going to utilize my resources to support the work of the local church. That's just not for me. That's just not who I am. And then they even go for, I think God is leading me in a different area. God is telling me to hoard all my resources. You see how little that makes sense? That's exactly what Paul was saying. And then he reminds us, while it's not a command it's an understanding that as a believer, it is a part of my life just as much as sexual purity in my marriage, telling the truth, and being faithful to one another. That is a mark of a disciple of Christ, and so is a generous heart. And so we give because God has given us so much. It's not of obligation or because we are commanded to. We don't give for salvation or holiness we give to glorify God. So giving 5% when necessary is permissible. So is giving 15 or 20%. A standard 10 is very solid. It is, again, what my wife and I decided to do. I, I use it as if it worked good in the Old Testament, while it's not commanded of me, that principle worked well, and I think it also works well. 
in today's world. But it's not a command. So don't leave here saying, well, I've only been giving such and such a percentage. Am I living in sin? No. But if you do decide to give, if you agree as a family, you understand that when you give, it's done out of joy. It's done at a worshipful heart. Not to give at all or to give disproportionately to your income or to give grudgingly, that is a sin. To not give 10%, that's not a sin. But if that is where you feel God is leading you and you feel a sense of guilt every time you write that check because you know it's not in proportion, then I would say question that giving. Ask, is it done for worship and glory to God or am I doing because I feel like it's an obligation or I'm supposed to do it? Paul reminds us it's not to be done in such a way. Everything belongs to God anyway, and the better we understand that we are stewards of these possessions, stewards of this life, stewards of these relationships, these jobs, our church, our finances, all of our assets, even our talents, then we understand that in order to be a worshipful steward, a loving steward, it means giving back in a way that is proportionate to what God has given me. And when we see blessings for what they are, that heart of worship becomes easier. That heart and longing to worship through giving becomes a joy in your life. That's what Paul is telling the early church should be. Giving and generosity are to be a joy. When we understand that it glorifies God, it helps us grow in our good deeds, helps us grow in righteousness, and it leads to thanksgiving in our hearts and thanksgiving in the hearts of those who are blessed by it, then we see truly what generosity looks like. Let's pray. Hey guys, it's AJ Layton, lead pastor at Access Point Church. We're so glad you guys have found us, stumbled upon us, or have been long listeners. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our page, share with your friends. We look forward to seeing you next week.